mission is to bring together top venture capitalists to compete so you have the insights on how the best VCs invest. All right, so we're competing, right? So ESPN Around the Horn format, we're going to talk about macro questions, we're going to talk about fundraising questions. They are going to debate, hopefully, and hopefully not all agree. And you guys are going to vote on who wins each round, and then two people move on to the finals, and one gets a title belt. That beautiful title belt. You want me to take that title belt away? Let me hold it. Okay. <laughs> Let's just start it off with the first question, right? So uh, how this works, we've got Slido. Again, QR code is going to be voting on that. Uh, first four questions are the first round. Two get kicked off, move on to the finals. So as the defending champ, we're going to have uh, Olivia kick this off. Right? Macro question. Bitcoin is up. It's to the moon. I think you guys have seen that. Maybe the markets are changing. How does this recent ascent say about the current market conditions in venture? Is money flowing again? How will it impact venture investing? Again, this macro. So Olivia, tell us a little bit about the current market. Well, I spent almost none of my time thinking about crypto, so maybe that'll get some thumbs down Ooh. in the audiences. Um, but I would say it has zero impact into whether or not uh, dollars are flowing in venture. I think the crux of most of this comes down to how LP capital is flowing. So for founders in the room, if you're an emerging L a GP and you're going to raise a fund, you're probably talking to family offices and fund of funds. I think uh, Goldman Sachs published something last week that... 60% of family offices are not even interested in crypto, so those people aren't touching it. If you're a more established fund, more than 100 million assets under management, you're raising from like endowments, pension funds. They probably have a very small subset of their strategy that has to do with uh, crypto, but really what every GP is asking themselves is, if I had to go raise a fund tomorrow, would I be able to do that? And that determines you know, how people are pacing and deploying capital in their current fund and what they're projecting uh, for the future. So no impact. Okay. All right. What do you got, uh, Zara? Zara? I mean, I think for me, I will also just caveat that I've been a VC for seven weeks, um, so my opinions. Congratulations, are be like, community builder. Commu like I. So for context, I was a founder twice. One of my companies did really well. The other one failed miserably. So I feel like I come into every answer more leading from like my experience as a founder. I think like, kind of like Olivia said, I feel like crypto and what's happening there, unless you're a fund that is directly impacted by it, I feel like VC as a whole from a macro perspective is not gonna be that affected. That being said, it's kind of one of those things where when you think about the way that VC is just trending right now, like I'm a consumer investor, everyone's leaving consumer, but the LPs that are part of Headline Ventures, which is the fund I'm at, they're all very excited about consumer. Um, some of our LPs are like some of those big like luxury fashion houses in Europe and stuff. We've been around for 26 years. And so when you think about like, Bitcoin going to the moon or everyone's leaving consumer. There's all these trends and things that kind of are brought up frequently. And I don't think that's always indicative of, I guess like the overall market, like you can't let that sway you that much. And like, we have a lot of conviction in consumer. I have a lot of conviction in consumer. So when everyone's kind of fleeing, we're staying put. So I think it really just depends on your strategy, who your LPs are um, and what your GP is looking to do. Jesse, Introduce yourself too. We we kind of skipped intros. Olivia, I'll get back to you. But Jesse, why don't you introduce yourself and talk about the the macro? Sure. Setting. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm Jesse Middleton. I run a firm called Flyridge Capital. Uh, we're one of the firms that's over 100 million in assets. So you're not wrong. We're a lot of endowments, institutions, things like that. Uh, I've been doing this for running the firm with my partners for eight years. Uh, seed stage fund. We invest very heavily into uh, applied AI and developer platforms doing that a long time. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the question on crypto. I, I think the biggest thing is uh, if one of your investors owns crypto, then they're happier today, so they might be more willing to write you a check. <laughs> I, look, the early stage is uh, where we play. We're writing one to three million dollar checks. And uh, it, the, the, um, the fact is that so much of what we do is based on sort of gut feeling, right? It's you know and you see it. We do look for early traction. There's indicators if you're in consumer, you have things you look for in, you know, Dow to Wow to Mal, you know, these things. If you're an enterprise, look for logos. But there is a part of this business which is like, we got to gel, we got to get along, got to feel good. And like, frankly, that may be the only benefit in venture when crypto's up is if your investor invests in crypto, uh, you know, they're going to feel better today. 
Victoria, introduce yourself. Talk about the overall market. We don't have to talk about Bitcoin as much. Just there's money flowing. Just where, where are we in the it's venture? It's money flowing. Um, that's actually funny because I spent like two weeks ago at a large scale philanthropic organization and charting the flow of money. Um, <laughs> Because I'm, I'm me. Anyway, uh, my name is Victoria. I'm one of the GPs and co-founders of a fund called Seed to Harvest. We invest in women of color, pre-seed and seed, building software companies with a product focus. So my background, my whole career was in product, going from that zero to one phase. And through gaming, fintech, insurance tech, I've been everywhere, built airline apps, um, but always kind of the first iteration of the product. And then I decided to create a VC firm really focused on that. Um, going to Bitcoin, though, what's interesting about Bitcoin and, like, I was reading an article today about it and was talking about how it mostly follows the trajectory of like the S&P in interest in technology. So if you want to create a rosy picture, like the, the increased interest in crypto means that there are people more willing to think about and invest in technology. But honestly, people are going to do what they're going to do and they're going to invest where they want to invest. I like met a family office a couple years ago that was like, we only do crypto. And I was like, really? That's a terrible <laughs> idea. But they that were bullish on scary. it. But the people who are <laughs> bullish on it are bullish on it. And those are people who are going to invest. So to your point, like it's not really about what's hot or trendy. Also, most of the things that are hot and trendy are hot and trendy for like 2% of the people and everyone else is just trying to do what they're going to do. Um, so that is like the biggest lesson of VC is basically ignore almost every headline especially if it's a trend, and really focus on what you're actually trying to do and what problem you're trying to solve, and you'll find the people who want to invest in that. And if you don't, then you know, sometimes that happens and you have to start over. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, let's bring up the QR codes. This is just for voting the first round. This is easy. Like, this is nice and soft. No one's uh, debating. But Olivia, we skipped you with your intro. Do you want to talk about Forum? I'm Olivia. Uh, I'm a partner at Forum Ventures. We're an early stage uh, fund here in New York that's focused on B2B SaaS. We have three different vehicles for how we deploy capital. We have a studio where we co-build uh, AI, applied AI companies. Uh, we have an accelerator fund where we're looking for kind of pre-seed companies, helping them uh, go from kind of zero to 250K in ARR and then quarterbacking that fundraise. And then we also have a, a seed fund. Um, we'll look at anything in, in B2B SaaS, but spend most of our time across healthcare, fintech, e-commerce enablement, applied AI, and vertical SaaS. And important announcement that if you had a drink tonight, you should definitely tip the bartender. Bartender is going to bring out the QR code vote for Olivia. There you go. Um, why don't we see the, just the results on the first question, and we'll move on to the second one. Yeah, you have to look it. You have to look at the it. results. <laughs> Olivia, bartender. Woo! Do you want to? We could push it over. We don't go for ties here. Do you want to scan the QR code? Well, I'm not not moving on until someone scans and move this up. <laughs> Next vote. We got five. Oh, that well, just went down, but three. we're still tight. That's hilarious. There we go. All right, let's move on. The QR code off. It's just because I said ah. one word. <laughs> it's all right. Listen, listen. It's it's a cumulative vote. Gene's got the, the slide out. Gene, props to you. So at the end of the four questions, all the all the points will be uh, combined. And then we got it. So let's move on to the next question here. Open AI is back in the news. Elon's beefing, right? I don't know if you saw that with Sam Alton, Altman calling it uh, closed AI. It's the meme king. <laughs> Two years old. All right, so this question's in regards to governance for founders, right? Uh, at the time of an early stage company, how much time did the early stage company spend on structuring for itself on the long term in regards to governance, right? Um, so let's, Jesse, why don't you kick this off? During a due diligence period, what are investors looking at when it comes to governance? Are they looking at that? I mean, talk about that. Yeah. Well, there's a lot in there. So, uh, no, when, I, when we're first investing, typically there's either no company or just a company and there's limited governance. Um, I, I would urge any founder who is going to raise a round of capital, you would like to create some semblance of governance early on. It is a good habit to form. It is a good practice to have board meetings. It is a good practice to build the communication skills that you will need for later. I will tell you a story about a founder very briefly who recently called me very upset that one of his investors did not help him out in the way that he wanted. And yet he doesn't have a formal board. And he said, why don't they act like board members? And I said, because they're not fucking board members. And so uh, I think that there's something to be said about having true governance in this. On the realm of like, how much do I care as an investor? I care that you're thinking about it. That is the thing I care about. I care that you are paying attention to what 
I might care about, what future investors might care about. And so with that in mind, whether you're using good cap table management software or your Fidelity private shares. There you go. Or, or you're structuring a board, like if you're thinking about it. Yeah, do I get points for that? The, uh, I'll vote for you. So, uh, you know, then that's what I care about as an early stage investor. Here we go, Olivia. I would say similar to us at Forum, um, we are very similarly often in, in first institutional check into a lot of these companies. I think a question that we often ask founders, um, especially when maybe there isn't huge delineation between CEOs or who is exactly going to be uh, the CEO of the business is like, when you two disagree on something, who has the final say? If, especially if you have an even split of equity and people always say, well, we agree on everything. We have a great working relationship. We've known each other for 15 years. And I'm like, Right, but when something goes really wrong and you're not disagreeing on something, who gets the final say? So even small steps like that, but I think um, we've seen many incredible companies die because a co-founder is not willing to let go of something. So I think setting that up, especially for all the early stage founders here, is a great way to get um, governance set up. I think the things that are also super important is things like accounting and how you think about finance. Um, it's something very easy to have like your folder on your desktop where you put all your receipts and you keep something in a spreadsheet, but um, the more you can get a handle on that, especially in this climate as you're thinking about mitigating burn and increasing your runway, I think is super valuable. Victoria. Um, so I'm gonna two part this question because I actually love the, I mean, I think Elon's really petty, but I do like the idea of thinking about, and I think about this a lot with early stage companies, is like, what is your mission? What are your goals? Like, OpenAI was a research project, right? It was supposed to be for humanity. and then they closed it and now they're making a lot of money, which is a choice, right? Um, and so it's really important to think about in the beginning, like what are, what are the things you stand for or what are the things you don't stand for? What are your no's and what are your yeses? I don't think a lot of companies and founders think about that a lot because um, you're trying so much to just like make it till tomorrow or get that check or whatever, but you really need to think about what, is, what are you gonna, willing to say no to? Because you're probably gonna have to say no a lot before you actually say yes, and that's what you need to think about. But getting into like actual due diligence governance, that goes into it, but I also think a lot from a tech perspective. My background's in product, so you know I get the demo. That's not really a demo, but you know you pretend like it works, but it doesn't. But you tell your investor it works. I get it. I know you're doing it, and that's fine. But when I'm actually due diligence you, I need to know that it works, and I'm not trying to be a Theranos investor, right? Like I want to know that it actually works and what's actually happening. Um, and so that's something I think a lot about is like, what can your technology actually do? What are your open source tools? Do you know that they're going to stay around long enough? I was at a company where Facebook shut off our open source and we had to rebuild it in three months. It was really fun. Um, and so I think a lot about those things of how you built the foundation of your company so that you can withstand the next couple months to a year. But also, do you have that flexibility to your point about the two founders? Like, do you have, do you know how to fight with your, your partner, right? Like you're basically in a marriage, like I'm in a marriage with my co-founder. Like you have to figure out how to fight with each other. And if you don't really know how you fight, if you've never been in a fight, that's a really big red flag. And it's okay if you fight, but you need to figure out how you move through those things and have a plan going for it. Even if that's just as much as like having a third party who comes in and like says yes or no to people. I've actually seen that. So like those are the things I'm looking for in terms of like how do you govern like your mission of your company, what you do and don't do, how you govern your relationships, and also how you govern your technology. I also feel the best part though of the Sam Altman and Elon fight was Sam's savage response of like all of the footnoted emails that Elon had right. sent him. Redacted emails. It's a good fight. They both know how to fight. Zara. Zara. Yeah, I think I'm going to open this up with an anecdote of a founder who went through like a horrible co-founder breakup. She was building a product with her co-founder. They were both technical, but one of them had built all the code and like was the reason that the app existed. They had like hundreds of thousands of users. They could not meet demand. Like they were just trying to scale as fast as possible. And out of nowhere, the co-founder who had written the code just decided that like he wasn't getting enough percentage or he wasn't making enough money. And he decided to take the code hostage and the app hostage and the company hostage, for lack of better words. And they had been friends, <laughs> to Olivia's point, for like 10 years. And it was like a flip of a switch where th there was no pr there was no like protection protection for either of them because there was no structure made because they implicitly trusted one another. And I'm a Pisces, so I always believe you should have the best. Like you should, you should have faith in humanity. Like I, I never want to be someone who's like 
oh, you have to think everyone's like evil. But I think that when it comes to companies, it's super important, no matter how long you've known the person, to protect yourself. Because when you protect yourself, you're protecting the company. And I've seen this happen too many times. Like this is just one anecdote, but I invest, um, I angel invest in a lot of really, really early stage founders. And I know I'm investing in the person or the people altogether. And I always ask them, to Olivia's point, like how are you going to get through fights? How are you structuring the company so that one of you can't take it hostage and like take the code hostage? Like that was a crazy situation. And she had to end up leaving the company. The company doesn't exist. And they were like ripping in growth, like 200, 300% like month over month. And it's really, really unfortunate. But the reason I'm telling you this anecdote is because I do think investors are thinking about it whenever there is a co-founding team or when you have like, let's say, a team, a co-founding team that's more than like two, three people. I've also seen companies pivot. One of the co-founders leave, but they still own 12%. And we are kind of like, okay, what is their relationship gonna look like? What's their involvement? They have just as much as your seed investor in terms of like ownership, but they have no involvement in the company. All of this to say, think about it early, protect yourself, have a really good cap table <laughs> management platform, which obviously Fidelity I private yes, shares. Bonus points. Fidelity. I wish I could um, vote for both of you this one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think my TLDR here is you no matter like how great people are, you just have to protect yourself and when you protect yourself, you protect your company. That's all. All right, let's do the uh, QR code. Any other stories that uh, you guys notable stories of governance? Founders fighting, you want to share? I mean, I haven't seen founders, but my first job was in gaming, so I've seen I've seen people not even a founder can be able to take down a company. So like security and compliance is very important. <laughs> um, like I don't know if uh, what is that show Mythic Quest on Apple TV where the CMO like basically holds their monetization hostage. I was like, I've seen it happen. So <laughs> it can be a lot of things that bring down a company. But to your point, I say like product is always people. And the same thing about building a company. Like if you don't have a process of how do you break up with people and how do you fight with people. It's, it could also, it, it will always end, but hopefully it ends well. For and everyone. also just really quickly on the company I just talked about where like one of the co-founders le co -founders left and they have 12%. This company has like 5 million downloads, like 500,000. I think right now it's like 750,000 daily active users. Like they're ripping and part of what's confusing about their cap table is there's like a million lines to it and they're just seed stage. A million, including this like 12%. So again, I just want to like hammer it, like just good cap table management software and don't get too many people involved too early. Yeah. <laughs> Voting's still open. All right. Like, seriously. No. Um, all right, let's show what we got for the, the votes good in here. Table. All right, didn't even need to vote for you. Well, I'll tell more will, stories though. going forward. <laughs> That just moved because of me. So, uh, <laughs> all right, all right. Let's move on to the third question here. Uh, we got a lot of pre-seed founders in here, right? Uh, they're looking to raise some capital. So this question is for you. In the current market, when it comes to pre-seed financing rounds via safe note, how much does the valuation cap influence your decision to participate as an investor, right? And uh, share any other thoughts on safe notes. But I'm going to come back to the winner, Cesara. Um, okay, so. Valuation is really tricky because, okay, not to keep talking about this one company, but it's the first deal that I'm moving forward on, so I really love them. Um, their valuation, they raised three years ago, 2021, when it was like the best time to raise. They had nothing but an idea, and they raised at like, I'm just going to call it an absurd valuation for the fact they had nothing. And so because of that, they went through a few changes, they pivoted, and now, we, like, I know a few investors that are thinking about investing in them. I'm like a user, I love the product, I've looked at the data, and it's just really difficult because they're coming from the expectation of that valuation when we were in a completely different market and it was a fund that loves to give really high valuations to early stage companies. And because of that, they're now in this position where they have incre like incredible metrics, like what I just told you, incredible usage. Like if you have more than 10 friends on this platform, over the months, your retention is around like 89%. It's like absurd, absurd. So my point here is that valuation is something that you have to like put your ego aside for. You have to think about what makes sense for your company because you wanna go and raise another round in a year, in 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, and you can't kind of like shoot yourself in the foot because you want like this huge valuation right now when it kind of is like unfounded. And so I always just encourage founders to really think about valuation as something that, okay, it's great to have like a huge, like a really high number, but it has to be something that's feasible for you to attain and build off of and get enough like improvement in traction, metrics, whatever it is, revenue 
so that you can justify the next raise. Because you wouldn't want to do a down round and you wouldn't want to just raise like out of five million more valuation for lack of better words. So obviously when you're early stage, just make sure you're setting yourself up for success. Don't try and go for a valuation that doesn't make sense and make sure you can point to everything when it comes to the reasoning as to why you're coming up with the valuation or why the investor's coming up with the valuation. And also VCs are very excitable, I think when they're, re when they're working really hard on a deal. So I would also like have a conversation about valuation. If they came up with it, how did you come up with it? What went into it? You can say it feels a little high if you think it does, especially if you're early, early stage. So yeah, that's kind of like that's my good answer. PLDR. You should TikTok that answer. I think we should TikTok we should click. The, yeah, is it yeah, okay, we're gonna, of course cool. it is. We're gonna use On that TikTok for TikTok. Soon. Victoria, we're gonna come down the line. So Victoria, you're next. She was talking about TikTok. It's gonna be her first TikTok tonight. No big deal. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so yeah, I I completely agree. Um, I think about the, I talk to founders about this for a lot. Like especially in 2021, when people are just like. Like I had a company that raised like a, I think they were valued at 30 million at seed and which is insane. Um, and like you put a lot of pressure on yourself to have to meet those expectations and not only on yourself, on your company. And so you wanna think about what kind of company you wanna be. Do you wanna grow at 10X? Do you wanna grow at 100X? Do you have, think about the growth metric you have to meet that if you have this valuation now for that next round, what do you have to be valued at? And what are the metrics you need to get there? And are you willing to put your company through that? Those are the things you need to think about. And also, I think you know people get really excited about being able to say, I raised five, ten million dollars. Those numbers sound really nice, but almost think of it as like debt. Like it's not technically debt, but like you are in partnership with people, and things could get rough, things could get ugly, things could be great, right? Uh, but you take on that relationship, and that's something you have to think about. And so. Going back to the question about like valuation cap, another thing I don't think a lot of people are thinking about now are deal terms. Like we've been in a pretty founder friendly market and now that's becoming less founder friendly, more investor friendly. And I'm seeing a lot of interesting terms being put in, in, um, into deals and especially in safe notes. Like uh, I forgot who said this to me, but it was a great quote with basically like, safes are fun because everyone always ends up unhappy and thinking, about, and thinking they got less than they originally thought, right? Because like you put in the discounts valuation caps, you think you own 10%, then you own 12, then you own four, and like it's all until like it actually breaks down to a price round. And so the things you wanna think about, like what are the terms, what do they actually mean, and how can they affect me in the future, and do a lot of scenario planning, right? Because no one really knows because you can't really predict the future, but if you know the consequences of your choices, at least you're prepared for what might happen. And also, I cannot stress this enough, think a lot about who you're partnering with from an investor standpoint, because you know, you take a deal, but it's not that friendly. When she gets rough, it will get rough if you don't have the partnership and the relationship with that person to move through. So, I, again, like all the hype and all the craze of VC, like I love the beginning because everything, there's so much possibilities. And if you get in on a good deal and if you get on like a really level-headed deal, you can get so much exponential growth because people are just waiting for like the new hot thing, the fast, the like crazy growth. And I was like, crazy growth usually spins out. So you really want to think about like what is setting you up for long-term success. Champ, I, champ. Go I ahead. agree with everything uh, that's been said. I think one thing to think about with valuations at the early stage, it is very much a result of supply and demand. So if you have a ton of demand, interest in your round, there's a lot more leverage for the founders in pushing up that valuation as people are interested in getting into it. Um, Back to the question of like, does price or in this market, how are you thinking about price? Forum is a fairly price sensitive investor in general. Um, I think what a lot of founders don't understand is when uh, you go out to uh, LPs to fundraise, beforehand you're putting together, you're doing some portfolio construction, putting together a strategy of like, how many, how big is your fund gonna be, do you think? How many checks are you gonna write? What's gonna be the average size of that? How much ownership are you gonna target? What's gonna be your follow on to reserve strategy? And so when we put that together, as you said, you can't predict the future. You're doing a bunch of different scenario modeling as the portfolio actually gets constructed. But for us, we've kind of committed to our investors. We have target ownerships that we try to stick to. And so we pass on a lot of really incredible founders who the round is just too pricey for us. With the checks we're writing, we're 250 to 750K. Sometimes we can't get that percentage that we're looking for, but we're always happy in those situations to send folks to other investors in our network who are less price sensitive than we are. I almost feel it's a disservice putting that in when you're sending a deck to a, a VC too, because it, like, it, it cuts out a, a long, a, a big group of VCs, right? Because they're automatically evaluating what yeah. you think it's worth, but the VCs I mean, I think also for us, like, ooh, 
yeah, oftentimes you're, it's a conversation of what the round is ultimately going to be priced. I think when founders are like, this is the price of the round. I'm like, cool, how far are you in the fundraising process? They're like, today is my first meeting. And I'm like, okay. Um, so I think that there is some of that at the early stage. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a conversation. As both of you guys said, like, it's not going to be set in stone the first time you have a meeting and um, can continue to evolve as the round comes together and as you get checks coming in. But yes, at a certain point, if we're going to participate, we want to know like what the cap is on the safe or if it's a price round. We generally don't lead, so we're looking to another investor to set that. Jesse, bring it home here. Yeah, so first thing I would urge you, don't put a price in your deck. Um, it's, it's not a good idea. There's like sales 101. Don't be the one to make the offer. Like, wait. Um, especially if you're raising on safes, right? So at the end of the day, one of the positives of safes is that you don't have to agree with everyone. You could give a different deal to everybody who invests. You know who you're going to piss off? Everybody who got a worse deal than the last person. But you can technically do it. Uh, and so in a price round, you got to set a price, right? But, but I'd say, you know, I'll say something that's maybe a little bit less popular amongst venture capitalists. I think as a founder, it's like in your best interest, you're looking for the highest price. Like, don't like, like, we're going to talk you down. That's our job. We do this a lot. I've backed 68 companies. Like I, like, I think I've talked most of them down. Uh, the ones who I haven't, they're probably my best founders. So it's like the, the, uh, I, I think the point would be that, you know, you want to get the best price. You want to be diluted the least. I do agree, you know, across the board here, you're setting yourself up for failure if you set a price, a cap or a price in a round that is not able to be 3 x the next time around. Whatever your goals are, whatever your growth goals are, whatever your metrics are, users, dollars, profit, I know it's a scary P word, but profit, whatever your goal is, if on the other side of that, you think you could back into a valuation that's three times more, that's an okay valuation to raise that today. If you can't, you will be viewed in the venture orbit as like underperforming. That's just like general rule of thumb. There are a million examples. You can all come up to me afterwards and tell me about all the examples where that isn't true. That's true. Uh, and so I think the first thing I'd say is try and get the, like, the best price for you. Get diluted the least. We want you to own a lot as investors because we want you to get all the upside. And as an investor, the math usually at the pre-seed or the seed is I have a target ownership. It's a combination of my ownership target and the amount of dollars you want to raise. That's usually how you get to a pre-seed price. Like, it's not math on performance, traction. We're not comping you to public companies. Like, that doesn't work. If my target's 10% and you want a million dollars, you can do the math, I can do the math, there's a cap. Uh, and so, so I think that's, for me, it's sort of funny money math because it's not based on actual success yet. With every round that happens, you're going to be comped more and more. So post that, somebody's going to do the math. Does your revenue work out? If you built this company, you got to 100 million. Are you going to be able to be worth you know, four times that, 10 times that, 20? They're just going to comp you to public companies or other big companies. Uh, let's bring up the QR code. Shout out to Funny Money Math. I like that. It's pretty good. I, Anyone I disagree? Tell. I want some disagreements, but, but go is, ahead. This is not a disagreement. Just really quickly, I want to just call another. it a disagreement. <laughs> you can disagree with me. It's fine. No, 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 no. It's not. It's not. It's more. It's more just like a good example of I think what you said. I will caveat this by saying I've worked at 15 startups, so please don't try and figure out which startup this is that I worked at. But um, th there was a startup I worked at, and I joined like under like 20 employees, scaled really quickly, and. Um, I think the founder was just chasing a valuation that I think was something that they viewed as like almost like a metric that they had to hit. And it was, again, it's like kind of unfounded. Like it's not like something that is actually like measurable. And because they were chasing this number that was like this golden number they really valued, after that it got to a point where raising the next round became really, really hard to do because you just you reach this number that maybe you should have reached like two, three other fundraises down the line. And now it's like, how are you going to communicate with your employees that you are not raising at a valuation that's above that, or you might have to raise at a valuation below that. And I just think like, don't put yourself in that position because it is like, there are terms that are thrown around in our ecosystem, like unicorn and decacorn and like things that you want to strive for. But I think it's really important to recognize that the TechCrunch article that calls you a unicorn is not worth like trying to get a billion dollar valuation if you're not ready for it. And I have had like later stage founders like really try and work towards that when I just don't think makes the most sense. Yeah, I also think something we didn't talk about, which is important, is how much money you're raising. I definitely hear people just raising a million dollars at pre-seed because it sounds nice, but I want to hear why you're raising that money. So it's not just your valuation, but again, that 
again, that simple back of the napkin math is like, all right, you're raising $500,000, this will give me 10%, 15%. So if you don't need a million dollars, you also don't need to raise a million dollars just to say you raised a million dollars, which is another money chase or a number chaser people do. And so there's math on both ends to think about as well. Results are in. Funny money math. That's how it works. That's how it works, babe. I will tell you funny money math story, which is, Please I do. was, uh, so, so how many of you know of WeWork? <laughs> so I spent six years building WeWork from the ground up. As most of you know, we had a sky high valuation, but I will tell you in a very short one minute story about how our investors got to this crazy valuation of $47 billion. Um, <laughs> ultimately at WeWork, we had an incredible model. Take a space, chop it up, sell it for three times the price per square foot, make it flexible, and give free coffee and beer. Like, that's it. It's a really good model. You want to make vibes. money? Go do that. Like, you'll make money. Um, along the way, we amassed a few hundred thousand members in our spaces around the globe, and each member would spend roughly between two and $7,000 a year with us. Typically, there's a decision maker, like one of five people, right? A five-person team. The way that we got to this crazy valuation was not as a real estate company, Obviously, somebody asked me, like, were you a tech company or real estate? I was like, real estate. The way we got to it is that somebody believed we were a tech company. And the reason they believed it is if you have 250,000 people working every day, 17 hours a day in your building, doing everything there, you can probably find other things to sell them. Health insurance, food, more beer when you run out of free beer, uh, housing, you name it, wave pool time. Um, all of these things were possible at WeWork. Uh, if you just build a payment processor, you can take 2.9% on every transaction. So you think about 250,000 people, they spend, let's say, 60,000, 80,000, $100,000 a year on their housing, their office, their health insurance, their food. You take 2.9% of that and multiply it by the 250,000 people, and you get to a very, very, very big number. That is how you get to the funny money math of $47 billion. So I did say funny money happens early on. It also sometimes happens later on. In either place, your goal still as a founder, try and go really high on valuation, but don't screw yourself for the next round. All right, there's a gem right there. That was good. We're gonna clip that and put that on TikTok too, you know? <laughs> so we need someone running our TikTok if anybody wants to. Somebody has to teach me how to use TikTok. Yes, then. yeah. Well, I'll teach you. Have access to your phone then, you're good. Uh, all right, so we're gonna talk about evaluating early stage startups. And this is your chance to talk a little bit of trash about VCs, which is fun, right? Um, what does a typical VC overvalue when evaluating an early stage company? And what does, on the flip side, what do they undervalue evaluating an early stage company? Victoria, please trash talk anybody you want. Um, I think something I've seen that people overvalue is other VCs' due diligence. Like the amount of time they're like, oh, so and so, I already due diligence them, so I don't have to do as much. It's like, you don't know what they did. You don't know if they even do diligence them. They might just be someone's wife. I've seen that where people get investment because they're someone's wife. So that's one big thing. Um, personally for me, I don't think people go through the tech enough. Like, especially early stage, people just, especially with AI, Jesus Christ. Like, people are like, they're using AI, it's fine. And you're like, do you understand their data sets? If you don't understand what data sets these people are using, they could end up with crazy stuff, especially in the healthcare market, especially anything where they're making any decisive decisions um, about hiring. <laughs> yes. I mean, like diagnosis versus like just making a suggestion. But um, for me, those are the things that I'm thinking of right off the bat. Um, I also, I think people go too hard on like growth metrics and they're doing like, okay, they're a hundred percent. Like you can make those numbers anything you want. Um, you know, if you go from two to four to six, it sounds great, right? Percentage wise, but number wise, it's not great. And I'm actually more curious about, can you convert? Are you actually consistently uh, increasing your conversion? Especially if you're an uh, enterprise or B2B from that funnel. Do you understand, like if I give you a million dollars, do you understand how to make that to more million dollars? That's what I care more about. So. For me, those are the things I think a lot about and the things I think are overhyped, but I'm sure there's more. So I don't know how many people here understand venture capital math, but I'll just like really quick math lesson. I promise it won't be too dry. Um, in order to make money as a venture capitalist, we had to first return the capital that we raise. And then after that, we get paid on every multiple after. Um, the reason it's important is that when you go to raise money from a VC, Part of what we're doing is trying to figure out, can I make back my entire fund on this investment? And so I'll just use the $100 million fund math. Um, if I invest a million dollars in you, 
Can I imagine that million dollars turning into $100 million post-dilution? So you're probably going to raise more money, I'm going to dilute to 50%. So then I can back into what's the size company, how big do you have to be? I personally think the thing that most VCs, especially in early stage, overvalue is exactly what we were talking about before, which is valuation. If you back Uber at any price yeah. under a billion dollars, you did really well on Uber, like as a venture capitalist. It does not matter. If you did it under a hundred billion dollars, you're one of the best VCs to ever exist. And if you're like Chris Saka and you did it at like 10 million, well, you have billions of dollars to go spend on whatever you want. So like valuation, I think, is often uh, a lagging indicator of something else that like we're not comfortable with as venture capitalists. And we lean on that sort of valuation thing as a reason to not do it. It may be right because maybe the company can't be massive. We don't believe it could be a billion dollar company. But ultimately, that's one that I think we over index on often. I do it too, so I'm not bashing anyone, I'm bashing myself. Um, I think on the undervalue, we have seven criteria that we um, evaluate sort of post pitch meeting. One of them is we call it the Pied Piper effect, and this is not the Silicon Valley Pied Piper startup. This is the fairy tale that children like. Uh, how amazing is this founder at getting people to irrationally follow them? That is investors, that is employees, that is customers, that's users, whatever, the press, that's a big one. And so it's important because there are very few companies that are gonna raise one round and then turn that into a billion dollar company. Sam Altman seems to think there is an opportunity for that with one person billion dollar companies, that's great. Uh, but if you need to raise more capital, if you need to hire more people, you need to be able to get the best people to join you like three clicks before they should. Like they need to be irrationally following you. And that's the true for all three of the areas that I was talking about fundraising, you know, employees and customers. There is something that we're not saying about valuation, which is that everyone is doing it themselves. Like there's no like one way to do a valuation. And so I, to your point, like that irrationality definitely comes into the point of like, what do people believe is your valuation? There's no like actual specific formula any one VC does. Most VCs have their own way of making evaluation. So like that's something to really think about as well. Uh, especially when you're thinking about due diligence and to your point earlier of like, how are people coming to this number? And actually like, I personally really hate some of the, like the irrational following of people. Like I'm really obsessed with cults and it definitely has this like cult-like thing of like, there are the cult founders who like, no matter what they do, people will just give them large amount of monies. And I think that's a really shitty part of VC to be honest. But to your point, there is like the, the good and bad of it of like, you do need people to really believe in you. And there's like, I think the belief in a founder that is really important. Um, but also I think it's really important to be able to tell them like, you're, this is not working. So somebody recently told me this, I love this line, so you could steal it, I don't know who said it, but um, they told me you want to back pirates. Pirates, imagine this, you're like a pirate and you go out on the seas and you convince people to follow you across an ocean that you can't actually see your map to attack other people, to steal stuff that you don't even know if it exists and you're probably gonna die of scurvy. Like, back a pirate, somebody who gets crazy people, like amazing people to just follow them to do what they're doing. I think it's a really interesting like, paradigm. I, I think we undervalue that. I may or may have not been arrested in high school for pool hopping, and when we were in the paper, we were the pool pirates. So I just want to put that out there. I'd back you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Sarah. Yeah, I think, so similar to the people kind of thing, I, so my fund headline ventures, I look at seed to series A consumer opportunities from like fashion. We did like Bumble, GoPuff, Acorns, um, the real, real. So like we'll look at anything consumer. And I've started to meet other consumer VCs that do around the same stage. And I got looped into a deal that I was like, okay, this looks interesting. Like I asked the VC who made the introduction, why do you find it interesting? And they were like, oh, the founder has a good pedigree. I was like, what the hell does that mean? What is a good pedigree? Like explain this to me. And they were like, oh, went to a good school, worked at this company, worked at that company. And that really frustrated me because I was like, do you have any thoughts on the product, on retention, on growth, like anything that felt tangible and they couldn't point to anything. And so to me at that point, I'm, this is something that I'm, I think the new generation of VC will hopefully like work towards eradicating, but this idea that like a good pedigree is, is worth something and that's like indicative of the direction a startup is gonna go in. Um, obviously there's a lot of signals people love to look for, whether it is like, it's very different if you like scaled a company yourself, you were like the second employee scaled it, that's different. But if you were like, 
if someone's saying you went to this school or you did this MBA program and therefore you're worth more attention than another pitch deck that came into their inbox that doesn't have that context, like I think that's significantly overvalued and it is something that has been brought up like shockingly more times than I thought it would be, at least so far when people are making introductions to me and they put a few words about the founder in. And yeah, I think it's easy to harp and like cling on things that people recognize, but I just don't think it's like a fair way to assess the quality of people and the quality of the company or the product itself. So I think that's very, very much overvalued. I think undervalued, and this is very consumer specific because I'm learning a lot about consumer investing right now. Um, it's interesting to me that some VCs will say like growth at all costs. Like we just want to see it growing exponentially like hockey stick growth and that's great. But then I'm like, what about retention? Like what if retention's 2%? Like you want, you still want them to be growing like a crazy amount. And so I've gone back and forth with VCs being like, okay, I understand that this is linear growth, not exponential, but the retention is crazy. Is that not worth more than growth itself at like the seed stage or the pre-seed stage, um, which is like pretty early? Uh, so yeah, it's just been interesting to see how I think like from a metrics perspective, I think retention is significantly undervalued in consumer investing, particularly with social apps and like growth at any cost, I think is kind of like a old school, like 2010 mentality that hopefully we're getting past. I, I think retention is like way more important than rapid, rapid growth until like series A at least. I agree. I think there's a, an interesting delineation because I think founder market fit is really important. Like I want to see founders who have experience or exposure to this problem or understand, uh, you know, the domain that they're building in. But I 100% agree of like the pedigree um, comment I think is one that is overvalued and that Part of VC is pattern matching, so saying you went to a great school, you worked at a great company, um, this might be a future indicator of success. I think we spend less time though thinking about like personal grit and resilience. I think like all of the founders who raised their hand at the beginning of this can probably attest to like the entrepreneurial journey is so challenging and lonely. I feel like externally in the world it's portrayed as this like glitzy, sat fast, sexy thing, and then you're like, oh my god, I am here with this like mess of a thing that I am trying to figure out. And so I think that like there's lots of different signals that you can uncover about grit and resilience and experience that people have had that allow them to be really enduring founders, especially in markets like these. I think the other thing at the early stage, um, especially for Forum is obviously more generalist when it comes to B2B SaaS, so we're not experts in every single space or industry that we're investing in. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to uncover how the founder went about validating this as an actual problem. Um, and really getting into the minutia of like, who did they talk to? What were those conversations like? How many of those conversations did you have? What did you actually learn? Do you have an understanding of willingness to pay in that? I think a lot of people say, I, well, I experienced this problem and I talked to one other person, so I know that it's going to, and, and the market is $500 billion. I'm like, okay, you haven't really done any sort of like bottoms up assessment of this. You haven't talked to any people. And I think that um, especially when you have a founder with like strong pedigree, I think a lot of VCs will like take a swing at something that hasn't really been validated where they're like, yeah, this person's great. And they like have built something before. So let's throw in a check. Yeah, I would I'd definitely piggyback on the problem. There's so many people who lead with the solution and not about the problem they're actually trying to solve and who has that problem and can map it really well to their market. And so like that's something I look for immediately when we're talking to founders is like what is the problem you're actually trying to solve and how well do you know this is a problem? That's that's really important. Final voting right now, who makes the finals? Do we have any disagreements here? Please. I, so so overvalue. I, I mean will, I like I will somewhat disagree on the pedigree one. I don't think it's that it's overvalued. I mean, so I agree that it's sometimes overvalued, but we do have to look for signals as venture capitalists. And so if you made it into the hardest business school program, by the way, I dropped out of college, so I'm not like speaking for my own, uh, but if you made it into the hardest business school program in the world that accepts like whatever 0.1% of applications, made it through that, went and worked for five years at Meta or OpenAI or name a company, and then you left there, like you have unlocked a bunch of things that come because of that pedigree, right? They come because of that network, they come because of that time you spent, they come because of that company and its success. So like, I mean, I was joking with my partner today, but like if somebody is leaving OpenAI today and they were there for more than like two years, I'm like, you should probably write them a check. Like they're leaving one of the hottest companies in AI, like who's actually built something that's making a boatload of money. It's not just like magical, you know, whatever. 
and, and they're choosing to leave that journey. Like the pedigree in that does matter. It's a little bit of a shortcut. And so I, I do think we overvalue it. I think you could, you certainly find people that are like, oh, I went to Harvard. I'm going to back them because it must be smart. But like, it is a shortcut when you're in this like super crazy environment and you meet yeah. a thousand founders. Yeah, what I think I'm like, I'm leaning more on the latter part where it's like when I meet a VC and that's all they tell me, I'm like, there's way, there has to be way more than that, which is what I meant by overvalued. And like, I went to Columbia for undergrad and it has like some low acceptance rate, but I've met like a lot of, people who went there who are not like the smartest um not to be like not to be like shady or anything but i think like it's also just coming from the perspective of like i think hard work can look super different like really quick story like i'm an immigrant here i'm the first in my family to go to college in america i'm the first in my family to go to an ivy league blah 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 my dad uh, my grandparents were refugees and my dad like climbed the ranks to like give me the life I have and my siblings and everything. He didn't go to an Ivy League, he didn't do any of those things and he like succeeded in life in a way that a lot of people that worked for him went to HBS and a lot of people that worked for him went to Stanford Business School or Columbia or blah, blah, blah. So for me, it's like I always think of people like that, people in Pakistan that get overlooked because they went to Lahore University of Management Sciences and not like Harvard Business School. So I always go, no matter how many pitch decks I get and I'm a junior VC, I'm getting so many, I will never describe someone by saying they went to this school, therefore they're worth talking to. I think that's like my high level here. Wow, there you go. Let's see the uh, results for this question. This is not for the finals. This is just for this question. Jesse and Zara are tied, which is nice. fitting because you two are the ones. There you go. <laughs> that was quick. Um, finals is Jesse and Zara. Jesse and Zara. So let's give it up to the finalists. There we go. Olivia is losing her belt tonight, unfortunately. We will keep you both on stage. You could be the, uh, no, you're good. You could stay there. You could stay there. Um, and I need you for some banter, too. But we are going to do more networking after this. So 8.30, we'll get kicked out of here. Theron's going to get the tab at the bar down the block. I forget the name of it, but we'll figure it out. Um, and let's you know, try to help each other out with this. So for the finals... Let's just kind of kick this off and do a little bit of a speed round. Let's call it like minute answers or whatnot, just so that we could get a little bit more out of this. Um, first question in the finals. Sarah, I'll start with you. <clears throat> pre-product founders, right? How should pre-product founders approach investors, get meetings to create urgency to close their round? Okay, so if you're pre-product, I think lean very heavily into all the research that you've done, like we talked about, into the problem you're solving and what solution has existed in the past that, that has not gotten like pretension or just people haven't used. I think mapping out the problem is the smartest way to tackle showing that you actually know about the space, showing what direction you want to take the product in. So I'd lean very heavily on that. And in creating urgency, this worked in 2021. I don't know if it's going to work now, but some of my founder friends who were pre-product would just say like, okay, we're, we just started, we just started raising, we're closing in two weeks. And like, I think that urgency just forces VCs to move quickly. There are some deals that like my team will be really excited about, but we move so slowly. And I'm again, seven weeks into this. So I'll be like, we have to move fast. Like what's going on? And so I think like some Sometimes over time, VCs can be like, oh, like we can take a few days. I feel like giving a timeline, being persistent, following up is really, really important because I talk to like 30 founders a week and maybe like four of them will follow up with me. And it's just be really persistent, always send the follow up email and continue to like lean heavily into the knowledge that you do have about the space. Jesse, pre-product founders. Yeah, I think that the research helps a lot. I, I think show a demo, even if it's not uh, yet live, like show show me what it is that you want to build. So do it in Figma, do it in something else, but like help me to see your version of the story. Your job as a founder is to get me to follow you. This goes back to my Pied Piper comment. Like you want me to follow you, you want me to believe you, you want me to believe you before I maybe should believe you. So I think one of them is get really good at storytelling. As a tactical thing, start with the investors who are least likely to back you and practice on them. Uh, <laughs> Don't make that me, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. The, uh, but no, take the ones that are like not the best fit for you, practice on them, hear what their questions are. I think that's one thing. And then the second thing I'll tell you is, uh, you know, we are pattern matchers, like that is our industry. So use this for that. Like you can't raise a big round on that. You're gonna need meat to it, but like 
help me to just understand, like if you're building a marketplace for two-sided marketplace of something, I don't know what it is, like, hey, it's like Airbnb for this. Let me explain what I mean by it. Don't just leave it at that and write Airbnb for this, but like use that to help us match patterns. We wanna see that there's an opportunity for this to be massive. Also, like I'm a visual learner, so if I don't understand what a founder is doing, I will tell them, show me the Figma, show me a demo, and then everything clicks for me. And so I really, really lean into that because I'm actually aghast at how I am incapable of understanding words sometimes. And so when I see the product or a video of it or the founder like shares their screen, I get the I get it so much more. All right, we're gonna save the voting for the final, right? All three of these questions are coming out uh, at the same time. Jesse, I'm gonna stay with you. Uh, Sponsored by Fidelity Private Shares. Um, when considering equity allocation. Here's Fidelity. Right, um, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Walter likes that, I know that. Uh, when considering a, a equity allocation for co-founders and early hires, what's a good model for, determi for determining each person should be offered? Jesse. Okay, co-founders. Uh, if you're equal founders, split it down the middle. This is gonna be super rational. If you're unequal founders, like one of you started slightly earlier and then recruited the other one, it doesn't have to be down the middle. I do think there is value if there is a CEO who is clearly the leader. One of the things in the first question was around how do you manage you know, sort of your board and other stuff. There is value to having one person who has more votes than the others. You frankly won't use those votes for any of the early stage things, but it is nice to sort of balance it that way. On the early stage founders, uh, or early stage employees, I'm sorry, you're typically reserving roughly 10% for like all of the people beyond the co-founders in that first round. You know, I'll rattle off a couple of roles. You don't have a founding CTO, but you hire a CTO, you're probably paying them somewhere between five and 8%, super high, it's probably the highest amount you're giving away. CPO slightly less, CMO slightly less. Uh, you probably don't need a CMO at the very beginning usually, but uh, ultimately most roles are gonna be somewhere in the like one to three percent range and that is your founding team of five to six people that's how you make up your ten percent and then you'll make a new option pool when you raise your round yeah i think i would hop on that really quickly and also say the when you're thinking about it from just yourself or two co-founders, you have to think that the employees and the talent you're gonna hire, you have to retain them. One of my favorite things in No Rules Rules, which is um, the Netflix co-founders book, is that he says like top talent is the most important thing to retain and you're only gonna retain them if you retain them, if you pay them well and keep them happy. And I think like equity shares, that's such a huge part of it. Obviously like beyond the founding CTO, but like the first head of growth you hire or sales, like you can't, you can't, obviously startups don't always have that much money and I think people anticipate not getting like the best salaries, but I think shares should be something that is made abundantly clear to your employee about what they're getting. I know some people who got their first startup job and they had no idea how much ownership they had. They were like first 15 people in the company and they got duped. So I think lean heavily into the fact that you want to retain your talent at any cost, especially the ones who are there with you early because they're the ones who understand a majority of what you're building. And I think last thing I'll say, and this is more cautionary than like guidance, I guess, do not give advisors that much of anything. Because like I've had, I've had, founders tell me they want me to be an advisor and I'm like, okay, yes, like I'm in a Gen Z, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like that doesn't mean you should give me any shares. And I say no actively because don't like shoot yourself in the foot. Like advisors are great, but, and obviously some of them, like I'm going to caveat, like there's going to be people who are very accomplished that you should obviously compensate. But like I've met a lot of founders who just want an advisor because they went viral on TikTok like twice. Like that's not a good enough reason. You should be really choosy with who you're giving shares to. Like find another way to compensate that person. Really, really remember that your employees are what matter most. I've seen like I've seen, oh God, I almost said the name of the startup. I've seen, um, I've seen certain companies just lose their talent because they did not compensate them well from like a shares and equity perspective. So just always remember that there's future people you have to retain. Your company is only gonna do better when you let go of control a little bit and delegate to these future people. And if they're not compensated and they're not bought in, then you're not, you're building a company that's not really gonna exist in the future. Cause you need other people to be bought in and to help you with it, so yeah. We got one minute left. Last question. AI seems like you guys all need AI in your in your portfolio. That's that's cute. That's nice. Uh, what do most investors get wrong when investing into AI? Zara, quick. I don't know. I think there is just too much emphasis on like okay, the difference between what is a wrapper on AI that already exists and what is 
genuine AI. So one of my friends is built, has built her entire AI. It's a really, really stealthy company, but they have three million plus users all between age 12 to 14. They built their own AI. So it's not on top of anything else. I meet a lot of AI companies that are on top of AIs that already exist. I think investors just need to know the difference between that. And I lean a lot more heavily into like the talented 15 year old like AI builder that's building something from scratch. That is really, really compelling to us, at least at Headline and me as an angel investor versus like a rapper on something. Okay. You? Yeah, I, it's going to affect every part of our lives. So it's, it's hard to say there's something that you shouldn't apply AI to. But I do think one of the challenges would be uh, early on, you have very limited capital, very limited resources. Don't blow all of your resources and money on sort of building your own like data set, like I agree at some point you need unique data sets, but it is rarely going to be the pre-seed or seed stage founder who somehow captured enough data to make a worthwhile trained model. And so use the stuff off the shelves until you grow bigger, I would say is one, one major thing here. I, one other thing, I just want to go back one second to the tactical and the equity thing. This is just a recommendation for me. Your mileage may vary, but I think you should do it, which is, uh, I think you should offer extended exercises to your uh, employees. We have founders that do it uh, now by saying if you stay with the company past four years, we extend your exercise to 10 years. That means that yes, you get them to stick around while they're earning their equity and they get a lot, but you're not making them feel like they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Equally, you don't want to keep talent around that has like that you have outgrown. You don't want them to stick around and be like, well, I can't afford to buy it, so I guess I'll just rest and hang out here and just do enough to make it buy. So I just, it's a tactical thing. You should ask your cap table people if that's yep, a good you idea. You could do that all on Fidelity Private Shares. Amazing. Um, all right, we are going to wrap this up and see who the winner is and who's going to have this beautiful belt and give us a uh, pump-up speech before you guys could all pitch them and before Jesse runs out of here because we are at time for you. But uh, Gene... I guess you can see it. we can see the results. Why don't we bring up the results? Let's bring them up live. Oh man, it's moving. Woo! 16. We got a lot. A lot of people can still vote. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna keep keep going. I'm gonna give it like 10 more seconds. 10 more seconds here. Give you some. Is it moving? 30 people. I think we got more than 40 people in here. But uh, maybe let's call it 35. We'll get to 35. Oh, oh. Jesse's moving. Not as much as he needs. All right, I think we got a winner. I think we got a winner. Zara, congratulations. Thank you, guys. Thank you. you have the belt. Do I Please take the dais. Do I get to keep this? No. Oh. This Very is, sad. This is a prime time belt. This event has sponsors, but not that. Yeah, jeez. Yeah. That was, yeah, I was like, really, I was like, I want to Can you please pump up the, the, the founders, give us a pump up speech? Okay, well, I'm. Stand in the middle and oh, just okay, show fine, that fine. belt and. Okay, okay. So do I'm your, just. I'm just gonna say really quickly that, again, I've only been doing this for seven weeks, so I feel very honored. Maybe I'm just not jaded yet, um, and that's why I lean a lot more on anecdotes. I think in terms of this ecosystem, I adore like venture, I adore startups, I adore founders. The longer I've been in VC, I've kind of started to understand why VCs are the way they are. So I will just say give VCs like a grain of salt, especially just junior VCs. Um, and then <laughs> I think they, they kind of have a lot thrown at them and I completely understand that now. Last thing I'll say is if you're building in consumer, please do not feel disheartened by people like fleeing from the scene. I think there are very much investors that are still here, very excited about it. Headline writes checks anywhere from two to 50 million. We're a $4.1 billion fund. We're deploying across the entire world. And um, if you're doing anything that's adjacent to consumer, whether it's B2B to C, consumer in general, please reach out to me. I also am happy to introduce you to like any other investor that's investing in your space. I write a newsletter that I can feature you in. It goes out to 40,000 people. Um, so if you need to build up a wait list or anything for your product, yeah, just like reach out to me. I, I love being a VC and in this ecosystem, although I miss being a founder. So I love talking to all of you. Um, thank you guys. I don't know if the bar is still open. We're going to go to the bar afterwards on Theron. Let's, let's take a picture, and then you're going to get pitched. You guys are going to get pitched. <laughs>